Crime Photographer. Hello, Pete. Oh, but say, you know, <laughs> I was asking a guy in here the other night to name me one of the oldest industries in America beginning with the letter G. I can see what you were leading up to. Yeah, but you know, he's been listening to our program, and he says right away, glass making. Right, Ethelbert, it is glass making. And one of the oldest institutions in the industry is Anchor Hawking, the world's largest makers of household glass. Prime Photographer. Brought to you by Fire King Oven Glass. Anchor glass containers, anchor caps and closures. All products of Anchor Hawking. A great name in glass. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole, our adventure for tonight, The Duke of Skid Row. <laughs> Midnight, a dingy, poverty-stricken street of gloomy tenements and cheap lodging houses. Above the uninviting door of one of these latter places swings a dimly lighted sign that identifies the Davis Hotel, one dollar per night. A taxi cab stops in front, and a tall, very thin man alights from it. His clothes are shabby, but clean and well-fitting. In one eye is a monocle, in his hand a jaunty walking stick. How much do I owe you, please? The mater says two seventy. It is five dollars. Keep the change. Huh? Say, thanks. Good night. Hey. Yes. You know, cabs ain't easy to find in this part of town. Do you want me to wait for you? No. I should not be going out again tonight. Meaning you're living at Flea Bank? You may draw your own conclusion about my residence in the Davis Hotel. Oh, no offense, mister. Thanks again and good night. Good night. Hello, Duke. Good evening, Davis. I stand at the window when you get out of that cab. What's the big idea? I do not understand. Cab rides cost dough. You owe me over a week's rent. Oh, that little matter. The sum of my indebtedness to you is uh, how much? Five bucks for last week, and you're two days into this one. Here is $20. Hey, where'd you get that kind of dough? You may keep the change. Huh? I'm leaving this place tomorrow morning. Maybe? For good. Give me the key to my room, please. Ah, sure, Duke. Where are you going from here? My name is not Duke. It is Smythe. Mr. Smythe. I am going to live like a gentleman again. Good night. Night, Mr. Smythe. Uh, Mr. Davis. Yeah? I do not wish to be disturbed tonight. Again, good night. Huh. Twenty bucks he gives me. This morning he asked me for the lend of a nickel. I can't figure that guy out. Well, gents, what can I do for you? A man came into this place just now. A man that wore a monocle and carried a walking stick. Uh, what about it? We saw him go upstairs. So he must be a guest of this uh, hotel. Who are you guys? We will ask the questions and give the answers. Hey, what's the idea? I can't... We will not harm you if you do as you are told. You will take us to the room of that man with the monocle. Okay, okay, okay. And be very quiet. Yeah. His room's on the next floor, up them stairs. You first, just ahead of us. Sure. What, uh, what you two gents want with the Duke? The Duke? Is that what he calls himself? Ah, that's what we call him around here. It's just a gag. I don't know nothing about him, gents. He ain't no pal of mine. I don't know nothing about the dough he had tonight, neither. Dough? What do you mean by that? Well, that's what you hear about, ain't it? The rest of the money he got someplace. This man you call Duke had money tonight? 
I only saw 20 bucks, sir, but he gave me the idea. It's intéressant, oh. mon frère. Très intéressant. Huh? Never mind. Take us to his room. I'll get him to open the door. He must think you are alone. If you wish to live, my friend, do not let him know that anyone is with you. I hear, I hear. Uh, there's his door. Knock. Who is there? It's, uh, Davis, Duke. What do you want? I, uh, I got to you, man. I told you I do not want to be disturbed. Yeah, uh, it's bad personal matter, Duke. Open the door. Oh, very well. We get on to him. No, be spectacles. You, au pair. Please, please. You no. are going with us, son. No, no, I beg. And you will go quietly. Don't, don't. Oh. Slugged him with that gun. Quiet, innkeeper. It was necessary. Now for you, innkeeper, here is one hundred dollars. That signal for me? Put it in your pocket. Oh, thanks. It is in payment for your services and for what we are now compelled to do. Well, what do you mean by that? This. Captain Logan, that conk on the head was the last thing I knew till I come to. And I got myself downstairs and phoned you cops. You came to in here, Davis? Yeah, here in Duke's room. They slugged him and me. Duke and them two guys were gone. Also, the Duke's suitcase and everything he had in this room. Uh, Just like I told the precincts, cops would get here ahead of you, Captain. Davis, what name was the Duke registered under here? Uh, Smith, John Smith. Mm. Now, tell me all you know about this Duke, Davis. Uh, oh, he checked in about two months ago. I figured him for one of them European refugees who run out of dough. During the last couple of weeks, he ran completely out of it. He hung me up for his room and was getting his only mo- meals at the mission soup kitchen. You say he acted like a guy who once had plenty. Yeah, not just plenty dough. He acted like a duke in the movies. That's how we gave him his name. He used big words and spoke a lot of languages. Well, what nationality do you think he was? Uh, no one could dope that. He never said... You're going to be a big help to me. And the two men who came here for him were foreigners, you say? Well, they give out in a foreign language a couple of times. But I didn't get any of it. I only, I only parlay good American. Well, come on down to headquarters with me. You may find their pictures in our files. Okay. You take charge here, Sergeant. Yes, Captain. Hey, what's that? Just getting a picture of you, mister. You too, Logan. Oh, so you're here, Casey. Yeah, Annie and I have been getting the yarn from the precinct cops who got here first. We were just going to start upstairs for a get-together with you. You learned anything new, Captain? If you got the story from the precinct guys, Miss Williams, you got all of it. Oh, but what do you think about it? How can I know what to think yet? I haven't anything to work on. I won't have until I can learn more about this duke and the guys who took him out of here. Uh, their descriptions have already gone out. Naturally. The precinct guys got that on the radio and teletypes first thing. I'm taking Davis to headquarters now to look at pictures. Uh, wait, Captain, that, that's my fault. The sergeant will handle it, Davis. Hello? Miss Williams and I will follow your car what? to headquarters, Logan. Okay, Casey. Yeah, now let's go. Hey, uh, Captain, wait. What is it, Sergeant? Second precinct on the phone, sir. One of their men has found the Duke. Found the Duke? Well, the description fits all right, and the guy is dead. I'll talk to second precinct. Hello, Captain Logan speaking. Where is the body found? Hey, underneath the dock. Casey. This is getting interesting, Annie. Say that again. He'd been tortured before he was hanged, huh? Very interesting, Casey. I'll be right over. Goodbye. Seems you've just learned more about the Duke and the guys who snatched him, Logan. Yeah. Or have I? Fire King Oven Glass makes housework so much easier. Cuts dishwashing time, for example, by a full two-thirds and makes successful cooking practically a certainty. In fact, Fire King has so many points to recommend it that sometimes we overlook one of the most important facts about it, and that is cost. Fire King casseroles and baking dishes, Fire King oven glass pie plates and mixing bowls, and all the other Fire King oven glass dishes you will find at your favorite chain, variety, hardware, and department store are almost unbelievably low in cost. And each piece, is guaranteed for a full two years against oven breakage. Ask for Fire King Oven Glass by name. It's a product of Anchor Hawking. A great name in glass. Come 
come into my office. Thanks, Captain. You better sit down, Annie. You still look a little unsteady. I am. I mean, what that poor guy must have gone through before they strung him up. A sweet pair of killers did that job. And I still haven't a single lead to him. Logan, you sent Davis down here to look at pictures. Davis didn't find the kidnapper's pictures or one of the Duke either. Of course, your guys are trying to find the cab driver who dropped the Duke at his hotel tonight. Sure, right? they've been checking the hack stand since Davis told his story, but that'll probably take some time. Well, that driver can tell you where the Duke got into his cab, which may help you find out where he got his sudden wealth tonight. That money must have been the motive for the murder. Come in. We found that cab driver, Captain. The one who drove that Duke guy to Skid Row tonight. Oh, that's fast work, boys. Bring him in. Yes, sir. In here, fella. Okay. My name's Pinkus, Captain. Milton Pinkus. Hack license 10208. Sit down, Pinkus. Thanks. Your cops have told me what you want to know, so I won't waste your time or mine. The skinny guy with the cane and the one window eyeglass I took to that joint on Skid Row, I picked him up on a call. A telephone call? That's right, a phone call which tells me to come to 300 Summit Road, which is Mr. Matthew Brinsley's residence. What? What? Matthew Brinsley's? Yes, sir. So I go there, rings the doorbell, the butler says to wait a minute, and then the skinny guy with the eyeglass comes out and gets into my hack. He came out of the Brinsley mansion? Yeah, but he didn't look to me as if he had two dimes to rub together. And when he told me the place where he wanted to go... The Davis Hotel? That's the joint. Well, when we get there, to my surprise, he hands me five bucks and says, keep the change. Oh... What time did you drop him off at the hotel? Around midnight. That fits Davis's story. Did your passenger have you make any stops between the Brinsley house and the hotel? No, sir. Well, did he talk to you during the ride, tell you anything about himself? I didn't hear a word from the guy after he told me where to go until he got out. Now, when your fare got out at the Davis Hotel, did you see anyone on the street who might have been watching him, waiting for him to show up? Mm. Yeah, I noticed two guys standing in the doorway across the street. Yeah? Yeah, but I didn't pay them no attention. The only thing on my mind was to get out of that lousy neighborhood where there was no business for cabs. You drove away immediately, huh? Yep. Okay, Pinkus, you can go. Thanks, Captain. I want to get back on my job. So long. So long. How do you like the Duke's connection with Matthew Brinsley, Logan? That's a hot one, isn't it? Brinsley's a multimillionaire. Yeah, now that cab driver says the Duke had dough. Enough to give big tips. You know... Brinsley's been in several jams and his money's got him out of Casey. Yeah, I know. For receiving stolen property. Oh, Casey, a man with his wealth? Oh, he's no offense, Annie. He's a collector of historical antiques. He's a bug on the subject. Too. Yeah. And I'm going to see what Brinsley has to say about this business. Hmm? When? I'd like to go right now. I probably couldn't get into this place at this unholy hour. Let's grab a few hours sleep. Get out there first thing in the morning. Well, okay, Logan. I'll be with you. <laughs> Quite a joint, this Brinsley Mansion kitchen. Yeah, I'll say. I'll probably interrupt the old guy's breakfast, but here goes his doorbell. Hey, hold it, Logan. Someone's opening the door. Eh? Huh? When is it? Good morning. We'd like to see Mr. Brinsley. I'm Brinsley, but I can't talk to anybody now. I'm on my way to the bank. I'm a policeman, Mr. Brinsley. Huh? Here's my shield and identification. I'm Captain Logan of the Homicide Bureau. Homicide? Very well. Come inside. Thanks. Right. Hi. Yes, sir. Tell the chauffeur to wait. I'll be slightly delayed. Uh, yes, Mr. Brinsley. Uh, sit down, Captain, and... Uh... My name is Casey. Uh, what are you gentlemen here for? I haven't committed any homicide. Uh, Mr. Brinsley, you had a visitor last night, a tall, thin, shabbily dressed man who wore a monocle. What about him? I want you to tell me all you know about him. Why? He was murdered after he left your house. No, I haven't seen him, Mrs. Wheelbracker. Huh? Oh, yeah, I get it. Yeah, sure, Mrs. Wheelbracker. Oh, dear. <laughs> These women. Hmm. Here's your drinks, Casey, Miss Williams. Thanks, Edelbert. I was hoping you'd show up for you. So it was just a heart attack that killed the old guy, Casey. He wasn't murdered. No, Brinsley's death was a perfectly natural one, Ethelbert. Oh, not altogether, Casey. From what you told me, the shock of hearing about the Duke brought on the attack. Yeah. At first, I figured the Duke sold something to Brinsley. Some antique he'd stolen, maybe. 
Yes, but Logan hasn't been able to find anything that Brinsley might have bought from the Duke. And as Brinsley wasn't out of his house after the Duke left it last night... There wasn't nothing in that leather bag Brinsley took into his study. No, nothing but some very legitimate bonds. That's what he was taking to the bank, huh? Yeah, apparently. Mm-hmm. The way that old guy hung onto his bag, even after his heart began to kick up... And he insisted on going into his study alone, and he closed the door. He was in there long enough to have taken something out of the bag and hidden it away. Logan searched, you say? Oh, sure, sure. Desk drawers and places like that. He looked for a safe in the room, and there wasn't any. Oh, Casey, if he should find something Brinsley bought from the Duke, it still wouldn't solve the Duke's murder. Annie, I've got a hunch it would. Well, now, I don't see how. I think those two well-dressed foreigners who went to the hotel for the Duke were looking for the thing he sold to Brinsley. And I think if they believed that they could still get their mitts on it, they just might... Hey, Annie. What? Logan said he was going to the Brinsley house again. He ought to be there about now. Let's you and me go there and join him. I got the same idea you got, Casey. So my men are giving that study in there a real going over right now. That's swell, Logan. Well, what do you know about that? Isn't it often that you two have the same big ideas at the same time? Well, it's merely uh, coincidental. I had a first-class <laughs> basis for mine, Miss Williams. Not one of Casey's hunches. Oh, what do you mean? Well, I've checked with Brinsley's bank, and they told me that two days ago he withdrew $30,000 in cash. Now, they record serial numbers when dough is passed out in chunks like that. Uh-huh. And the $20 bill the Duke gave Davis last night has one of those numbers. Casey. Brinsley must have bought something from the Duke. What could he have paid the Duke $30,000 for? Uh, Captain Logan. Yes, yeah, Sergeant. We found something. Let's see. Come on, Annie. There, Captain. That big leather chair. What? Wait till I show you. I'm used to trick hiding places, but this is one of the neatest I've run into. Look, when you press these three ornamental nails at the same time... The seat rises. There's a big cavity underneath. What's that thing in it? It looks to me like one of those gimmicks the King of Spades wears on his head. Casey, it's a crown. It's a gold crown. Yeah, it's not much of a crown. It's gold, but there are no jewels on it. <laughs> I was just saying to myself, Captain, why hide that thing? It ain't worth more than a hundred bucks. It's probably worth a hundred thousand, Sarge. Huh? It's old and antique. Can't you see that? That crown would have fitted nicely in Brinsley's little bag, Logan. He may have thought you knew the Duke had sold it to him, that you'd search for it. So he took it out of the bag... And put it in that trick chair before his heart gave out. I know all that, Casey. But now, how will that thing lead us to the killer? Well, Logan, the good old power of the press can lead them to us. What do you mean? Now, look. The only metal in this chair are the nails and coil springs. And when that crown gets back under the seat, it'll show up nicely in an X-ray picture. X-ray picture? Yeah. That the Morning Express will be carrying in all its editions tomorrow. With a nice story that you'll write, Annie. Well, okay, but what'll I write? An invitation to the death house. Oh, two o'clock in the morning. And we've been sitting here in the dark for almost six hours. Well, we couldn't have a more comfortable place to sit in the oh. dark. Old man Brinsley put nice chairs in his house. You know, Casey, I don't think those men will come here. I don't either, Miss Williams. Only chumps would fall for that stuff in the express this morning. Well, aren't murderous chumps? Your come on was too broad, Casey. That X-ray picture showing the crown and that leather chair and Miss Williams' story. It was a darn good story, Logan. Thank you very much. I gave a reasonable explanation for that picture. I explained that the police, in looking for clues, had to take X-ray shots of almost everything in the house. Because Brinsley's executors wouldn't let the police tear things apart or remove anything from the house. You made it sound very logical, Annie. I played up the crown shown inside that chair as a big mystery to the cops. Well, naturally, I didn't say that it was a trick chair that you'd been able to open. And I gave a reasonable explanation for everything else in our come-on, too. For the house being empty of servants tonight, and for... The real come-on outside of that picture was the truth she wrote about the Duke's connection with Brinsley. Duke undoubtedly told his murderers about that connection under torture, Logan. And Ann's story will clinch it. I hope you're right. But... Quiet. Yeah, I hear. Somebody's moving toward the study. I think someone's taken advantage of that rear window we left open, Logan. We'll soon see. There he is. With a flashlight. He won't be able to see us behind this screen. 
There's only one guy. Hey, Logan, he's making for that leather chair. Slashing the seat with a knife, isn't he? Logan, he's got the crown. That's enough. Stick up your hands! Uh, what? We've been waiting for you, mister. You're under arrest for murder. Murder? Yeah. Murder of the Duke, known as John Smith. Where's your pal who helped you kill the Duke? I am here. Oh. Put up your hands. Huh? Casey. My brother is an expert marksman. He will do as he says. Where is he? I am in the dark, where you cannot see me. Drop your gun. Yes, he's got us, Logan. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you are wise. Now. But how silly they were a minute ago. My brother, they thought I had walked into their trap alone. These Americans are very simple people, Dito. Ah, I see you have the crown. Yes. At last. Now, our labor is almost done. Why did you guys want that bum hunk of gold so badly? Father, he called it. Tito. He do not know what it is. He called this bum hunk of gold. Huh? Well, what is it? We have no time to answer your question or the inclination. Besides, it is foolish to satisfy the curiosity of soon-to-be dead people. Soon-to-be... Oh, I'm sorry. If but... you live, you might cause great trouble. For the good of my country and for my brother and me, you must die. Show them, Baba. Now. Yes, Tito. Now. Sergeant, I... turn on the light. Oh, ah, we got him all right, Captain Logan. Uh... We were dependent on you, Sergeant. But thanks, thanks, just the same. And the next time, Logan, tell your men to crash in just a few seconds earlier. You, uh, you had these policemen hidden. Uh huh. And we Americans aren't so simple as you seem to think, Mister. Now, suppose you smart un Americans tell us why you killed the Duke. We say nothing. We say nothing at all. Yes, you will, brothers. Yes, you will. Get him to talk fast, Captain. We've got to get this story to press. Uh, you get the story, Annie. I'm going to get a couple of shots of these crown chasers and get them to the office. Okay, Casey, I'll meet you there as soon as I can. The traditional harvest moon is more than a month away, but already throughout America, most of the golden harvest of fruits and vegetables has been garnered, packed away for your use in the months to come. Now, the finest of these food products come to you in clean, sterile, crystal clear glass containers. And for a very good reason. The glass container lets you see exactly what you buy before you buy it. And the glass container protects the natural flesh flavor of its content. A very large number of these finer products of field and orchard, of range and sea, come to you in crystal clear anchor glass containers sealed with tamper-proof anchor cash. Products of Anchor Hawking. A great name in glass. Logan made them guys talk, huh, Casey? Sure, Ethelbert. Sure. Oh, it wasn't too hard a job. After Davis positively identified them as the men who came to his hotel for the Duke. Tell me what they said. Well, to begin with, pal, they told us the Duke wasn't really a Duke. Oh, I knew that all along. He was only a count. Huh? He was an honest-to-gosh count, too, Ethelbert. From one of those little European principalities that went out of business after the First World War. Yeah, and the Duke, I mean the count, was a relative of the king who'd lost his job. And he was also custodian of the royal crown, Ethelbert. He scrammed the United States with all that dough that he could lay his mitts on and the sacred crown. Only the money gave out after a while and he had only the crown left. So he finally sold the crown to Brinsley. Hmm. But the guys who killed him? They were stubborn royalists, Ethelbert. Fanatics about restoring their king who had to have his traditional crown if and when he was restored. Hmm. They went after the Duke and finally caught up with him. They forced him to tell what he'd done with the crown, and then they killed him. See, they considered the guy a traitor, Ethelbert, so they gave him the traditional punishment for traitors, hanging. They even tied a real hangman's knot. They thought it were a legal execution. Well, in their screwy minds, it was a legal execution. Hmm. Some people are certainly funny. Yeah. Mm. But as my sister Edna says, quote, 
If all folks was like you and me, wouldn't the world be dull? Unquote. And you know Edna. Crime Photographer is directed by John Dietz and stars Scott's Cotsworth as Casey. It is written by Alonzo Dean Cole and is based on the fictional character of Casey created by George Harmon Cox. If you're inconvenienced by returning beer and ale bottles, here's good news. Anchor Hawking has pioneered a new kind of bottle, so inexpensive that it requires no deposit. It will shortly be released for civilian use. Watch for it. The more convenient Anchor Glass one-way no-deposit bottle. A product of Anchor Hawking. A great name in glass. Our cast features Miss Leslie Woods as Anne and John Gibson as Ethelbert, with Herman Chittison at the Blue Note Piano. The original music is by Archie Blyer. Crime Photographer is brought to you each Thursday at this time by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees. Anchor Hawking. A great name in glass. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.